And uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Keith Lawrence. I'm the Senior Environmental Analyst with the Kellerton Valley Regional District. And it is a, a privilege and an honor to, to share the story about the Kellerton with you. And, uh, and thank you, Kim and, and Bob, for setting that, uh, that big picture, the global and the provincial perspective. And uh, my, my job essentially over the next uh, few minutes, short while, is to, to zoom in on one region in the province and uh, talk about some of the, the activities that are actually happening and, and some of the things that we can do, uh, but, uh, but also to, to, to hear from you. And so uh, on, on that note, uh, we'll be talking about how regional districts actually provide services. So what are some of the, the challenges and barriers, but also the opportunities uh, how we are actually going about and responding to climate impacts. And so uh, Bob uh, referred to us being at the beginning of a journey, and that is very much true in the Cowichan region as well. And so uh, we have uh, undertaken some actions, but uh, there's still plenty of work to be done. Uh, some of that's uh, in progress, and I'll talk about that. And some of it um, uh, we have uh, are, are very much open to those ideas and insights. And so uh, that's where it's really important to to hear and listen to your reflections on how uh, local government can, can be part of the solution going forward. And so in, in our region, uh, one of the, the greatest strengths is the passion of people for water. And, and water is uh, one of our favorite pastimes. It's also our livelihood. It's connected to forestry, fisheries, tourism, agriculture. It's also um, Water is also top of mind when it comes to, uh, to drinking water, uh, and particularly because our drinking water sources are so distributed. Uh, we were talking uh, earlier, and I was talking with, with Brenda uh, before the, uh, the session this morning about where our drinking water actually comes from in the region. It's a variety of, of groundwater aquifers, uh, but also four large surface water bodies. And so uh, there, there is no one single source. It is, it is broadly distributed. And so uh, without uh, talking about the characters and the key participants, uh, it's difficult to really tell a good story. And so that's, that's where we'll start the discussion is about uh, who some of the, uh, the key participants are. And in a 2014 uh, regional water governance study that, uh, that we conducted, uh, one of the activities was to inventory who are the participants in the region. And uh, we started looking at what's happening at the senior level. And, and one of the ways to visualize the various participants is looking at it through the lens of, of this estuary. And so this is the Cowichan River estuary. And we can see that uh, there, there are, uh, there's the river that, uh, that winds through a number of spots through the estuary. And, and the water uh, ultimately is under the, the jurisdiction of the, the Ministry of Environment. Uh, as it pertains to drinking water, also the Ministry of Health is, is deeply involved. Uh, we see some agricultural lands in the estuary as well, and, and those are under the, the purview of the Ministry of Agriculture and the Agricultural Land Commission. The private forest lands, so those hills in the background are mostly private uh, forest areas, and uh, so those are under the, the jurisdiction of the, the Managed Forest Council. In a regional district, uh, so outside the actual member municipalities, uh, in the regional district, the roads and highways are under the, the jurisdiction and operation maintenance by the Ministry of Transportation and Highways. So when we think about things like uh, surface water runoff from, from roads, uh, it's helpful to keep in mind that those are under the jurisdiction of MOTI. The fish, uh, that, is, that is DFO and Ministry of Environment. And so, we think about uh, how key collaboration is, uh, even at the senior level. Uh, but, but having said that, uh, the, the new Water Sustainability Act has some high-level language around uh, more opportunities for decision-making at the local level. And so that was one of the key drivers for this regional water management and governance study. And, and in that study, uh, one of the key uh, opportunities for success was to have collaborative governance with First Nations. And so uh, we're fortunate in the Cowichan that we already have a, a collaborative governance framework through the Cowichan Watershed Board uh, with the Cowichan tribes. But collaboration with First Nations broadly across the region, so that includes the other groups like the Venus First Nations and Malahat First Nations, 
was seen as, as key to moving forward on, on a successful government, governance model uh, because of the importance of, of traditional territories and, and water to, uh, to First Nations. And so uh, local government also key, uh, the municipalities and the regional district, uh, they have, uh, they are purveyors of water and so they have an opportunity to, uh, to uh, further uh, promote uh, water conservation initiatives but also uh, they have an opportunity to, uh, to influence what happens in the landscape through, through zoning bylaws and uh, through the different community plans. The stewardship community and the watershed boards and societies are, are extremely active in the, the region. So moving from south to north, we have uh, Shawnigan Basin Society uh, that is active in, in the Shawnigan watershed. Uh, we have a couch and stewardship round table and a number of stewardship groups that uh, are represented at that round table. Uh, and many of those stewardship groups are operating at the level of a, of a water body, so a lake or a river, and, uh, and they all come together through uh, a round table type structure. Uh, we also have the formation of some other uh, groups like uh, Monzel Creek planning process and also the Salt Air Water Advisory Group, and I've asked uh, Lynn to share a little bit afterwards in terms of what uh, the good things that they are up to. Also key are industry participants. We have, uh, as mentioned, private forest uh, landholders are significant. Uh, we also have uh, Catalyst Pulp and Paper Mill. And they have uh, a significant withdrawal from, from the couch and the in the order of uh, one and a half uh, meters cubed per second. So uh, think of about the volume of a concrete mixer being extracted from the river every five to 10 seconds. And that's about their their extraction of, of water. Uh, but also, uh, they have a license to store water up at Cowichan Lake, so they are a key uh, participant in any discussions that involve long-term water storage. And so the regional district, as we've been talking about, is really just one participant among these many, and that's really one of the key points that uh, uh, I wish to, to drive home there. Uh, but also key is understanding how uh, regional districts actually provide services. So there's some differences uh, between the regional district and the, the municipal uh, model. Uh, the, in the regional district, what uh, is actually required is, is after the board decides that it wants to, to actually do anything, it needs to get elector support. So it needs to go and get uh, what's called uh, elector assent. And uh, the local government tax sets out some, some uh, guidance in terms of tools for getting the elector assent from, uh, from the region. And so those tools include uh, a petition. So uh, most of us know what a petition is. It's essentially uh, a positive uh, assertion from uh, a number of, uh, of residents that they'd like something to happen. And so uh, that is one tool that is available. And that's often the case with, uh, say, a water service if a group wants to get together and and come together and say, we want to have a water service in, in our neighborhood, um, let's, uh, and, and we want it to be run by the CBRD, and that's the way it could, could come about. The other tool that is available is this thing called an alternate approval process, and it's sort of the opposite of a petition. So it's, it's when the board has some services that they want to provide, they provide a news release that they will be providing those services, and then it's up to the electorate to say that they don't want them. So, if 10% say that they don't want those services uh, through signing an electoral response form, uh, then uh, the decision has to be made whether to go to uh, a third tool, which is a referendum. And so we can see that the level of effort and, and the cost with each of these tools uh, varies, and it, 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 there is that incremental step. So the referendum has more effort and, and more cost involved, uh, but uh, that is uh, another tool that, that is available. And so, uh, helpful to, to begin the story at the beginning, and so when we think of the beginning of the story, we think of looking back thousands of years ago on Vancouver Island, and particularly uh, when we're talking about the Cowichan region, uh, we think of the, the old growth forests that were there and, and dominated the watershed, the, the large cedar and fir. Uh, we also think of the, the, the streams that were full of uh, not only salmon, but cutthroat and steelhead. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the fishing uh, was so renowned that it made, made headlines in, in London newspapers in the early 1900s. Uh, tile flats were, were abundant with, with shellfish, and, and not just abundant, but they were, they were clean, uh, safe-to-eat uh, shellfish. 
And uh, there were also uh, many villages of, of the Kalachin people, and uh, they lived uh, in this in this sense of, of, of harmony with the land. And another uh, illustration of, of the way things uh, once were is this map from the, the 1860s. And so it shows uh, a little bit about the morphology of the river and the way it once was, uh, particularly in the Cowichan watershed. We see the level of, of braiding and channeling in the lower portion of the watershed. And uh, that, uh, that provided excellent habitat for fish. Uh, it also provided an opportunity for water in the river to, to dissipate in a, in a more controlled way out to uh, the ocean. And so uh, we're going to talk about some of the changes that have happened there. Uh, so over, over the last 150 years, uh, we think about the changes to our watersheds. We've had uh, some significant uh, logging in the, in the upper watersheds. Uh, now uh, younger forests, and in some cases, uh, a lack of forestation. Uh, uh, it is, is dominating many of the watersheds. Uh, we also have uh, folks that have um, have uh, moved into some of these uh, areas, like uh, along the uh, the rivers and lakes, and, and that affects the riparian areas and the, the fish habitat, habitat, obviously, but also the uh, stability of, of slopes along those areas. Uh, there are also uh, 530 surface water licenses on, on the Cowichan watershed alone. Uh, and there are also 1,300 groundwa uh, groundwater wells uh, regionally. And so uh, those have put significant uh, demand on water resources. Uh, also, when we move down the watershed in the lower portion, uh, there was the construction of the Trans-Canada Highway. And so when we looked at the, the map that showed the braiding and the channeling of the Cowichan River, uh, much of that has, has been lost because of the, the construction of the highway and uh, the way that that, uh, that forced the flow of the river into a more channelized configuration. So um, that's, those are some of the changes that have been happening, uh, but um, the, the story is not all doom and gloom. an opportunity to, to, to work towards protecting what we have and, and enhancement of, of those areas that are key. And so, one of the actions that has been undertaken, uh, particularly uh, throughout 2015, uh, was a more coordinated approach to communicating what is happening in our region and what we can do about it when it comes to climate impact. So particularly with regards to, to drought and with flood. And so communications have been happening in the region for, for many years, but this was uh, a more deliberate attempt to, to make that happen in a coordinated way, uh, working with the various local governments to gather information about the impacts, uh, and also looking at uh, what we can do collectively to, to solve the issues. And so there is a, a website. Uh, there is uh, a, a, one of the tools for, for communicating the new normal in the region. And uh, the, the website has some information about uh, what homeowners can do, what businesses can do, and what uh, the agricultural sector can do when it comes to, uh, to water shortage and what can folks do to protect themselves from flood. There's also information about uh, water use restrictions. And so this year uh, was, was the first year that we had more coordinated water restrictions. And so all four municipalities, the CBRD, and some of the improvement districts came together and had consistent language about what the water use restrictions were and the timing that they were released. So to avoid these confusions of why do they have one set of restrictions and, and we have another set, this isn't, this isn't looking like it's a, a fair situation, uh, to avoid uh, those situations where uh, the timing was, was just inconsistent as well. And so uh, we're looking for further opportunities to enhance these water use restrictions. We have a number of private water utilities and other improvement districts uh, that could come on board through this process as well, and so we're looking forward to, to working with that. We also uh, worked with uh, with Cowichan tribes and the other First Nations on, on the messaging, and so uh, we're hoping to continue that in 2016. Is this provide a little bit of feedback? Or yeah. Yep. Okay, let's try to go How's that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Try going up. <laughs> Maybe I'll go. <laughs> Is that better? Okay. I'll just 
won't speak directly into it if I need to over these <laughs> systems here. But, so one of the sets of, of information that we gathered was how much water was used by various utilities. And uh, this is the example for the, the CBRD utilities that are, that are operated. And we can see there uh, when the water use restrictions were implemented. And so the yellow line reflects the, the implementation of stage two water restrictions, uh, which essentially is, is watering on, on only two days of the week instead of every second day. We can see that that doesn't have a huge effect, maybe a little bit of an effect at first, but then, um, then a plateau and perhaps even an uptick. Uh, but the stage three water restrictions where there is no uh, watering of, of yard and gardens, and that has really uh, of, uh, of a sprinkling nature, that does have a significant impact. Uh, in fact, that's in the order of 25 to 35%. And we noticed this similar pattern, a similar graph across the other utilities uh, for which we were gathering data. And so uh, this was, was recognized as that one of the successes of the program that we could see these coordinated water use reductions across the region. The other key piece of information, uh, not only knowing how much water we're using, but how much water we have is important. So we have four of our surface water bodies. Uh, this is this is one of them. This is Stocking Lake, and you can see the red line uh, is actually at one of the lowest so that it's been in, in the last 10 years. And uh, we can see it start to climb when those fall rains come. But in fact, Stocking Lake uh, it didn't climb immediately when the fall rains came, and so uh, there is a bit of uh, a lag time there. But really, the purpose here is to give people an opportunity to gain an appreciation for. Uh, that the water levels are, are not infinite. Uh, we do have finite uh, uh, resources, particularly in the summer season, and so that they can see and track how we're doing uh, relative to our full storage capacities. As I mentioned, there's plenty of tools on the website, and uh, I encourage folks to, to have a look at, at those that, uh, that are available. Tools for the home and tools for businesses. And so a second, area of, a second area of action was around uh, characterizing the watersheds in the region. And so the, the, the importance of this is really around being able to understand where watershed planning efforts need to be prioritized. So at what, uh, within what sub-watersheds, but also within um, which particular watersheds. And so we have 16 watershed regions across the region, and uh, we can see the complexity of, of uh, of the boundaries when we layer the, the various uh, jurisdictional boundaries of the electoral areas and municipalities here, but really being able to think about this in a, in a whole watershed way uh, so that we're looking at uh, the water from, from the source all the way through to when it's used. And so uh, there are a number of uh, parameters that we can use to, to characterize the water uh, sheds uh, so that we can understand their vulnerabilities to climate impacts but also so that we can understand their functions. So watersheds provide a number of key functions, including uh, fish habitat, but also an ability to modulate water quality. Uh, carbon sequestration, as we talked about earlier, is also key. And that's really just to, to name a few of the, the number of uh, services that watersheds provide. And so uh, fish habitat, uh, this, is, this is actually a, uh, an illustration from a study that was done in, in the Yellow Point area uh, on maximum canopy height. And so this is part of a broader uh, study that looked at uh, characterizing the watershed in terms of uh, water supply sensitivity, uh, but also those areas of uh, potential interaction between surface water and groundwater. And so the, the green and yellow areas are areas of, of uh, higher uh, canopy height within the forest. And so recognizing that uh, the canopy height is, is a key uh, indicator for the watersheds uh, because of uh, the capacity of trees to be able to water it, to modulate water quality and also modulate timing of flow. And so this was done through uh, LIDAR analysis, which is essentially uh, a very uh, detailed uh, look through uh, aerial uh, remote sensing systems and looking at uh, taking that analysis and applying it to, to develop a, a, a look at what the canopy height was. But we also looked at uh, the, the human footprints. We looked at uh, what were the various uses within the watershed 
And so those red areas are the areas of higher human footprint. So where we see more uh, intense agricultural use happening, where we see uh, more roads and, uh, and more development. And so uh, we layer these, these maps on top of each other. Uh, and uh, I don't know wasn't able to fit them all into this presentation here today, but it gave us an idea of where some of the areas of, of water supply sensitivity were within this watershed, uh, but also where those areas of interaction between surface uh, water impact, surface impacts, and, and the groundwater. And so uh, another key metric in all of this is, is fish habitat. And I was talking to, uh, to Pete Law uh, before the, the session about, about the information that we have in the region around fish habitat. And within one watershed alone, uh, for example, the Cowichan watershed, uh, we could easily have 100 reports on fish habitat. So there's a, a big chunk of work to go into finding where is this information and what is the most recent information available to us. And so the roles for the senior agencies have been changing. And so uh, the, the regional district is, is taking it upon itself to, to pull in some of these data sets from the provincial government and the DFO to understand um, what is the most recent data and how can we use this to, to characterize our watersheds. So this, this third area of action is, is, is around the flood and then the fourth will be around drought. Uh, we'll start with the flood since that's the, uh, we're currently in the season of water abundance right now. And uh, when we think about the flood, we'll talk about it from the perspective of the Cowichan Basin because that's where we have had some significant flood impacts in recent years. And there's a couple parameters of interest when we think about the Cowichan Basin. One is this precipitation gradient that we have among all many of the watersheds on the east coast of Vancouver Island. And so in the Cowichan watershed, uh, the rainfall in the city of Duncan can be in the order of about 1,000 millimeters of rain per year. As we move out to the town of Lake Cowichan, which is about halfway up the, the watershed there at the east end of the lake, uh, that number levels to just over 2,000 millimeters. And if you get to the back end of the lake, that number levels again to over 4,000 millimeters. And so significant gradient. We also have a fairly sediment-rich uh, watershed. So there's a lot of sediment in the river, and, and much of that sediment uh, gets transported down to the lower levels of the, uh, the watershed. And so that uh, presents some challenges for flow and, and management. So significant flood events occurred in the region in 1979, 1986, 2007, and 2009. So in the most recent flood event, there were uh, over 50, ham 50 homes were severely damaged and uh, property damage was, was also extensive. There's also impacts to the Trans-Canada Highway that impacts not only the region, but also uh, Vancouver Island. It impacts the movement of people, but also uh, the movement of, of goods up and down the island. A look at the floodplain area uh, gives us an idea that this floodplain actually crosses a number of different jurisdictions. So the floodplain crosses uh, two municipalities, uh, Couching Tribes lands, also crosses two severe electoral areas. So collaboration is key when we're looking at the flood protection needs for this particular basin. And so the opportunities to, to respond to flood are, are really about this, this journey and, and, and the flood events that have happened uh, that have led to this need uh, and also the risk for, for future flood events that uh, are perceived given the impacts that are, are being faced with climate. And so the development of an integrated flood management plan which outlined goals and actions for addressing flood issues was developed in 2008. Work began on actually implementing the actions the next year, uh, including the construction of dikes and sediment management within the watershed. And then this year was the year that we released uh, the, uh, this alternate approval process for the, the flood management services. And so the closing date for that is actually tomorrow, so we're looking forward to hearing the results from that. But there is a good chance that the, the AAP, the alternate approval process, will fail. And uh, we're, we're in full recognition of that. Uh, if it fails, uh, we need to still be able to have the authority to, to build the dikes. And so uh, the next step would be to go to that, uh, that referendum. And so that is, that is the reality of, of the process. Uh, but uh, we're looking forward to, to hearing the results tomorrow. And so uh, with the uh, approval
approval and, and the authority to, to go forward, uh, potentially these services could be implemented in 2016. And so what are the services that are in this bylaw? Uh, they include even the authority to receive provincial and federal funding, but also uh, the authority to, to build and maintain the dikes. Uh, now, there's also a key component here in terms of the education that is needed in terms of, of why um, dikes are, are needed uh, with, if, if you don't actually live in the floodplain. And so uh, really, um, it, that, that question might be more obvious to those who are in the floodplain, but for folks in the upper watershed, if they don't have uh, an area of business or an area of, uh, of interest within the floodplain, uh, there's uh, a key opportunity for, for education in terms of connectedness throughout the whole watershed and connectedness to connectedness of communities that are, that are in the watershed. Also key is the authority to undertake log jam removal and sediment and gravel extraction. So uh, the sediment and gravel extraction has the, the dual benefit of, uh, of improving uh, flow within the river, uh, but also um, allows for improved fish passage uh, in the summer months. So it is uh, one of these situations where we have um, impacts in the upper watershed that are, are affecting uh, folks downstream and uh, these are you know, key activities that are needed to, to manage not only flood, but some of the drought impacts. And of course, uh, flood monitoring and uh, an alert system to, uh, to be able to warn those who are most vulnerable to the flood impacts is key. Also important is to be able to have the establishment of a diking authority, which includes all of those participants that I've mentioned, so that they can come together and the coordinated decisions that are necessary around flood protection works. And so all of those services, as Kim mentioned, they can be successfully delivered if, if given the authority, but the authority needs to be in place first. So I had someone who had to call this off and go back to the feedback. So five minutes before I was about to leave for my ferry yesterday, I had someone come to the front desk and ask about the alternate approval process for the flood management. And, and they were asking, why are we building dikes when we have these severe water shortages in the summer? And I can think of, of no better illustration of why forums like this are important to talk about this feast and famine of, of water that we have uh, throughout the, the broader region. And what it indicated to me is that we still have work to do uh, in terms of raising the awareness if someone who is concerned about uh, the community uh, comes forward and indicates that, but we still have to have uh, further awareness around the impacts of climate and that these are problems that we can make a difference on, on solving. So in the Cowichan, uh, like many of the regions uh, in this area, we have this abundance of water in, in the winter and fall months, and you can see this difference illustrated at Scotts Falls in the Cowichan River. Uh, that's the uh, river trickling along there at four and a half cubic meters per second on the right hand side and on the left at several hundred cubic meters per second. So even if we're able to store one or two days worth of, of that water, uh, that makes a significant difference in terms of uh, how much flow uh, we can have in the summertime. It can make a difference of, of several weeks of additional flow at the minimum flows. So long term water storage is key. Why is action needed? Uh, Kim talked about 2003 being a key teachable moment in the province. It was also key in the Cowichan. Uh, that was a year of significant drought. Uh, it was one of the first years that uh, Chinook fish had to be trucked up the river. And it's had to be done several years since then as well, and most recently in, in 2014. Here we see uh, a river. This is, this is actually a tributary to the Cowichan Lake. This is Meats Creek. And it dried up in June. That was uh, anecdotally the earliest that it had uh, dried up in, in recent years. And it was only through the heroic efforts of, of several of the uh, community stewards in the region that they were able to, to rescue 100,000 fry from these uh, streams that were drying up and bring them back into uh, the lake or into the main stem of the river. And so uh, the, the keynote that I can really add here is that what we notice is that water shortages are at their most extreme when uh, demand is often at its highest. So when, when agricultural uses 
are, are increasing. Uh, when fish need passage up the river, we have these shortages. And so uh, that is also something that is, that is key. Water quality concerns and are, have, have a close link to climate impacts as well. And so we have in our region uh, some, some places where effluent is, is going into uh, our uh, Cowichan River, in fact. And uh, when the volume of the river is lower, there's less dilution of that effluent. And so that is a challenge. Uh, we also have a buildup of, of non point source pollution uh, throughout the drought period. And that has uh, resulted in when those significant uh, rainfall events come. Uh, we have had some, some challenges. And there's uh, some indications that those may be linked to, uh, to, to, to risks to fish when those, uh, those, those severe fall flushes come and flush those contaminants out into, into the waterways. And so similar to the flood, uh, there's an opportunity here to, to deliver services that can help to uh, mitigate these impacts and working with the community on these. Uh, the, the journey began uh, well before the, the 2005 uh, year here, but uh, that was the year that the Cowichan Basin Water Management Plan was, uh, the form for that was developed. Uh, in, in 2010, then implementation of the plan started. But other key groups have emerged in recent years. Uh, the Shawnigan Watershed Roundtable in 2010 uh, we've also had uh, the beginning of, of the design of a Wanzel Creek watershed management plan through a group uh, in that watershed. And also, as mentioned, uh, the Salt Terra community uh, group coming together to look at concerns in the Stocking Lake watershed. And the, uh, the new communication, uh, normal communications program. Also key were the, uh, was the proposal for another bylaw to implement services to uh, mitigate the impacts of drought. And uh, that bylaw has since been, a uh, proposal for that bylaw has since been uh, removed, but it, uh, there's a plan to re release it in 2000 and uh, early 2016. And all of this would lead to the development of a potentially a regional water strategy. And so these are activities that are all happening uh, in, in concert and, and potentially leading to a strategy which will help us prioritize climate. The services. Uh, include uh, one of the, the, the key ones is uh, looking at long-term storage up at the lake, uh, even being able to increase the lake level by an order of 30 centimeters to 45 centimeters. Uh, it doesn't sound like a lot, uh, but it makes a huge difference to the amount of water that can be stored. Uh, and so that is uh, one of the, the services in the, in the bylaw is to have the ability to, to have a license to be able to store more water and uh, to be able to, uh, to go and make uh, the necessary upgrades to the weir. Also uh, embedded in that bylaw includes <coughs> services uh, such as the hydrological monitoring network. And so uh, in our region, we don't actually have uh, a snowpack monitoring station. We rely on some of the information that comes from the RDN region. Uh, there is work underway and almost complete on a uh, snow monitoring station at the back end of the lake. But uh, the, the authority to continue operating and maintaining that will be needed going forward so that we can gather the, the useful data about what will hopefully be uh, years of, of snow to come. But uh, last year in 2014, uh, over the 2015 to the 2015 winter, uh, that snowpack was, was very limited. The other services that are also key here uh, include monitoring water quality. We've had some, some great, uh, in the past, some great collaboration with the Ministry of Environment on, on that. Uh, having said that, uh, with, the, with the current trends, there really is a need and an opportunity to take more of that into a local framework so that we can uh, have the local knowledge and the local people make local decisions uh, that are driven from, from the data from water quality testing and be able to, to have uh, more ability to, to coordinate with our, our stewardship groups and, and, and be able to carry that out. Also key is the uh, restoration work, so to be able to uh, restore some of the, the natural function of, of the watersheds uh, so that we can uh, not only uh, slow the, the release of sediment into the rivers, but also uh, be able to uh, improve fish habitat. 
And so really what this adaptation looked like, of course, it involves us rolling up our sleeves and actually getting down to doing um, physical work. But I'll, I'll leave you with this thought as well, which is that uh, there is a growing recognition for the need to recognize the true value of our natural assets, uh, not only uh, the, the current value, but the, the value of the services that they provide. And so uh, there is uh, there is work underway in, in some of the other uh, local governments to, to do that. Uh, there's an opportunity to get a better handle of, of what the true value of these assets are and be able to raise the awareness of that within the community. So, so thank you, and I'm going to turn it over.